everyone. Hello. Um, I'm so happy to have you all here. I would like really to apologize for this delay, which is due to technical issues. I'm so happy to have you all within our MBA uh, master class entrepreneurship series to talk about entrepreneurship and exactly to talk about the entrepreneurship ecosystem within Bahrain post COVID-19 situation. I'm happy to have you all here with the, as part of the MBA class uh, uh, within Ahliya University. Uh, I have with, with me in here my panel, um, and I have uh, to, uh, so I will start with Mr. Saleh, who is the Senior Program Manager at Plastic Lab Bahrain. Uh, Saleh is an active member of the MENA startup ecosystem. He is mentor and uh, he support, supported a lot of startups from all over the world. And he led uh, to securing investment in 36 startups in just over two years here on Plastics Lab International Accelerator Program. And uh, for those who doesn't know, Plastics Lab, uh, Plastics Lab is an accelerator uh, in Bahrain supporting uh, startups with a portfolio of over 270 startups. And he is also a Stanford VCU alumni. Uh, we are having also with Mr. Saleh. We are having uh, Mr. Nawaf El Kohaji. Nawaf is currently the CEO at Tenmo. He is committed, uh, driven, and dedicated to developing startup and startup culture in Bahrain, and to work together with the different stakeholders in order to benefit entrepreneurs and to encourage companies to grow and scale up. Uh, Nawaf started his entrepreneurial journey by launching food. Uh, company, uh, which is a specialized catering company in the Kingdom of Bahrain. Nawaf also has several years of startup and SME uh, experience while he was working in uh, Tamki. I have also with us today as part of the panel, Mr. Ahmed Janahi. Mr. Ahmed Janahi is currently the senior manager of partnership and uh, market engagement. He's responsible for the uh, uh, the market relationship, all the market relationship activities and overseeing the team managing all outsourced projects at Tamki. Mr. Ahmed has established himself as one of the leading figures in the training and the consultancy sector and for uh, uh, lending uh, a leading voice in the fast emerging management training industry. Um, he, uh, Ahmed, has worked on several projects with Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Youth in Bahrain and some other countries in the region, and uh, he is well experienced in advising educational program and bo at both private and public sector on various uh, issues related to economy, HR, planning, entrepreneurship, uh, uh, investments, and so on. Uh, also, we have today with us Mr. Ali. He is the founder and the CEO of uh, ADRI, uh, which is Arabic Digital Reform Institute. Ali is the CEO, as I said, and the founder of um, Adri, and he, which is a more of technology firm from New Zealand, and which is uh, recently established uh, its regional office in Bahrain. Ali's area of expertise revolves around technology and high tech and uh, tech startups. Uh, Ali is an often presenter with the Digital Inclusion uh, Week conference by the UNESCO and the ITU Arab States uh, via his company Adri. They are building the world's largest uh, Arabic research uh, repository, uh, uh, and he is an MBA holder. Uh, we are also waiting to uh, have Mr. Hussain Haji to join us in this session. Mr. Hussain is a serial entrepreneur that has launched four companies and successfully sold two of these two companies before his most recent uh, new venture, which is the Ingrab. Uh, uh, Hussain is coming from a banking background where he worked for several well-known investment companies uh, before he decided to quit and to uh, to pursue his own dreams. Uh, he left without a plan, but he failed it twice. However, he continued the, the journey. Uh, he sold uh, well, the first company to a private equity firm, and then the fourth one uh, was uh, acquired by a family business. Uh, his current vision is basically to bridge the gap between business and people by uh, monetizing word of mouth uh, and helping the employee 30% of the youth in the MENA region by using the Ingrab. And he's going to talk to us about his uh, business. So um, I'm so happy to have you all today as part of this master uh, class. 
and uh, I would love to maybe to give the uh, to leave the floor to our president if he's here to say a few words. So just one second. Waiting for them to join, and I would love to start with uh, with my panel by asking um, Mr. Ahmad Janahi. Uh, since he's working in Tamkin, and when we talk about ecosystem in Bahrain, the first thing that comes to mind is Tamkin. And I would like to ask you uh, to tell us and to tell the audience and our master students about the role played by Tamkin as one of the key players on the entrepreneurship ecosystem to support startups and to support SMEs, especially within this particular condition and situation of the COVID-19. Yes, Mr. Ahmed, the floor is uh, first of all, I would like to thank you and the entire team at the LD University for having me. And of course, your esteemed class and everyone joining us today in this session. Um, to dive directly into uh, the topic today, let me start talking about the COVID-19. So COVID-19 has adversely impacted the overall economy. Uh, while businesses across the sector can sense the uh, repercussion of COVID-19, Startups particularly have been one of the most vulnerable uh, and in fact are facing various difficult challenges, both from a business as well from uh, as an operation, uh, operations perspective. Uh, most startups have witnessed uh, a decline in support uh, that they've been getting from the different entities, uh, the supply and demand, uh, except for those startups that are engaged in the supply and delivery of essential services, of course and the companies uh, and the uh, technology infrastructure. Uh, Bahrain, I think specifically to talk about your question, I think Bahrain in the past uh, two to three years uh, have developed an ecosystem uh, that is very strong. And I think having people like Tenmu or having companies and entities like Tenmu, like the incubators, accelerators, the efforts of the banks, EDB and the rest of the entire ecosystem have, have helped the company to position the startups uh, segment specifically in a good position. Mm -hmm. Of course, that does not mean it didn't have challenges, but uh, the, the, the strength of the entire ecosystem is largely attributed to the effort of the stakeholders, the ones I just mentioned. Uh, yeah. Again, not particularly. And of course, the initiatives implemented by the government uh, to facilitate the growth. Uh, for us in Temkin, in the past, I would say, uh, 13 to 14 years since Temkin was established in 2006, we were established with two main purposes. One is to help the private sector to become the engine of the economy and to help Bahrainis, on the other hand, uh, to become a better choice in the labor market. I will not talk about the Bahrainis, mm -hmm. I'll talk about the, the private sector in general. Of course, the biggest challenge that we have is when, when we uh, healthy establishment of startups. And to have that, of course, we need an ecosystem. That's why Temkin kind of supports almost everybody in the entire ecosystem, including the, the uh, accelerators, Flat6 Labs, Brink and others. Uh, we work closely yeah. with, with Nawaf and the rest of uh, the investment community, if I may say, and with every single uh, ecosystem player. For us in Temkin, we've been trying since March, since the start of COVID-19, to offer a helping hand uh, and a hand of support to uh, micro and small businesses, uh, particularly in the country, by providing them grants uh, under Temkin's business continuity support uh, uh, and its initiatives. Uh, and as we speak today, we have two other phases of this project. The first is targeted towards the most affected sectors, and the other one is an advisory support for the businesses to help them think beyond uh, the current phase and to think about living with COVID-19. Uh, and yeah. Tim are trying to be here as a support to both the ecosystem as a whole and the individual entrepreneurs and their journey during this. What, what we can definitely say, nobody knows how would the future look like. The future is, is yeah. definitely unpredictable. But this notion of unpredictability and high risk is what makes the future very rewarding for some businesses that may manage to take a risk and put their foot mm -hmm. into the right direction. And I think everybody in this panel is trying as much as possible to help uh, minimize the um, 
minimize that part of, of, of challenges that the startups are facing in order to go into the industry. Yep. Thank you so much. Uh, I can see Professor Mantour, who is the president of Al University, uh, if he would like to say a few words before we continue our discussion. Yes, Doctor, the floor is yours. You are mute, Doctor. Just yeah, unmute can you hear yourself, me now? Professor Mansour. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes. Uh, first of all, I am really happy to uh, be with you and to see uh, this, what I would call an important event. And I think it adds a lot of value to our MBA program and to our MBA students. I also am happy to see these speakers, Ahmed Janahi and uh, his, his uh, other colleagues are here to talk to our MBA students, uh, Tom Keen and the others, from their own experience, from their own wealth of knowledge that they have accumulated. And it's always a pleasure to listen to uh, people from, from, uh, from certain domains, from, uh, you know, certain uh, strategic thinking, you know, uh, from, from um, who, who bring you different concepts. You know, uh, being a, an MBA student, uh, you know, I like the word master, you know, the word master, I don't know who invented it, but you're a master of business administration. The word master is very important. And this will add a lot of value to you to listen carefully to what these uh, experts say to you. Uh, I know you learn a lot of knowledge in your program. I know you do a lot of research. I know you do a lot of projects. I know you are taught by the very best. I know you do a lot of case studies. I know you do a lot of scenarios. I know you do a lot of reading. And, and some of you, and I'm really happy to say that a lot of you, they publish a paper in international refereed journals after their dissertation. This is all being achieved by Ahliya MBA students. But it is always wise to get a wider perspective. And I really want to thank Dr. Angie for taking this initiative to bring these key speakers to our students. I think there is a lot to be learned. If I were you as a student, I would take a pen and paper and write all the keywords. They were the keywords. You know, being an entrepreneur or thinking about entrepreneurship, you know, you can take it in many ways. One way is take it as general knowledge. You know, people talk to me and I have an idea and, you know, it's general knowledge. It doesn't harm you and it doesn't help you much. And you can take it one step further is, you know, uh, can I apply the concept in a small scale somewhere? Or you can be really a, a real adventurer and a brave person and, and, and go and do a project uh, and, you know, and, and take lead in that and, and take risk. There are people who will, who will mortgage their house to, to, to set up business. There are people, but really in Bahrain, in Bahrain, and thanks to Tom Keen, especially Tom Keen, they have enabled the Bahraini youth they have they are giving them the opportunity all right maybe there are better things that can be done in the future by but judging from the experience and the history a lot of money was pumped into making bahrainis become entrepreneurs and we know you know when i was a student in the uk in the 70s the uk government had uh, a project similar and they produced at six and i remember out of every hundred entrepreneurs one or two will become multimillionaires. One or two or three will become multimillionaires. Fifty percent of them will fail totally. But from the fifty percent or more who fail, they will try again. Failure is 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 a reason for more success. I really want you to pay attention. You know, uh, merge the theoretical knowledge, the academic knowledge, the research knowledge. And learn to ask questions, learn to ask questions, not always, don't assume. A lot of people assume. And it's also uh, 
a good idea. You know, somebody said this to me many years ago. I never listened. He said, why don't you start your own small business? Believe me, it will grow. It will grow. Start small. Don't sometimes you think too big and then you don't do anything because you overwhelm yourself. I mean, this kind of talk is for Ahmed Janahi and his group and these leading experts, <laughs> not for me. I only want to thank you for really joining, for joining us. But trust me, trust me, the opportunity is out there. Trust me that, you know, if you really learn to ask questions and learn to read from different websites, re read the right magazines, the right, go to the right websites, you'll get ideas. Sometimes the idea is 50%. The other 50% is how to do it. Tumkin will guide you. And learning from entrepreneurs is good, is good. But I'll tell you one advice. I'll tell you one advice, okay? <laughs> It's like bringing a famous artist who draws you fantastic paintings and wanting to learn from them. They are the artist. Now you have to learn a bit more beyond, you know, they will give you their own, but their own is their own formula. It might not apply to you, but you learn from it. You learn from it. Thank you very much. I only wanted to say hello and to thank you for all, for coming to Ahliya. And really, uh, I want to tell you that, you know, uh, just one last thing and I will stop. One last thing. There is a lot of talk, or there's been a lot of talk in the last few years that jobs will diminish. That because of the artificial, artificial intelligence revolution, uh, there'll be the many junior level jobs and entry level jobs will diminish. That may be the case, but I now I also say they used to tell us when computer systems in the years ago, it will replace people. But now look how many millions of jobs are in the IT. The artificial intelligence will create more jobs than we know. And it's an opportunity for creative thinking. It's a creative thinking that changes countries. It's creative thinking that changes the individual. And, and so don't worry about that. But there's one place which never disappears, the, for, the, which is for the creative thinker, for the entrepreneur. And read, read uh, biographies, autobiographies of famous people, how they made it. That helps you a lot. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mansour. Thank you so much. And I would like to continue with our panel before leaving the floor, maybe to our audience to start asking questions. And uh, I will continue with the uh, key players. I can see Professor Abdullah will come to him. Uh, Ahmed started talking about the entrepreneurship ecosystem and the role played by Tamkeen. And he mentioned, uh, as part of his uh, introduction, he mentioned the Plastics Lab and he mentioned also Tenmo as two key players within also the entrepreneurship ecosystem in Bahrain. And I would like to ask jointly to Salah and to uh, also uh, Nawaf, both of you, can you uh, at least tell the audience and tell our public what uh, exactly Plastics Lab is offering to entrepreneurs and what Tinmo is really offering to startups? And we need to see the difference between both both system, I mean, both of you, because Tenmo is an angel company and Plastic Slab is an accelerator. Maybe it's a bit confusing and maybe it's not clear for all potential entrepreneurs that we have now as our master students. So I would kindly ask both of you to introduce each organization and then to tell them, to tell the students, potential entrepreneurs, what are the differences between these two uh, entities and in turn, what are the supports that you are providing to those who would love to start their businesses? Yani, who would love to start? Salah or Nawaf, it's up to you. <laughs> Salah, you can, you can start. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> All right, hi everyone, and thanks for having me here. Um, so, Plastics Labs, uh, what we offer is uh, three, three things that are the main barriers that most entrepreneurs will face, um, which is capital in the form of $32,000, um, and okay. then network uh, so we've established quite a strong network only in not only in Bahrain but we're everyone needs to keep in mind we're the largest early stage venture capital company when it comes to investments and startups in the whole of Middle East and North Africa so we've got over 270 startups that we've invested in across the region 
And we have offices right now that they're in Beirut and Egypt and Tunisia. We're opening up in Jordan. Uh, we've had offices in Abu Dhabi and Saudi as well. And so also the idea is with scalability that whoever's, whoever you're, you've been invested in by Plastic South Bahrain or Tunisia or whichever area you're in, you still have access to all those facilities across the region and you have a team on the ground in those countries to help you with your business development and to connect you with re the right government regulators. Um, and so the third part I'd say is the mentorship. So what we do is we go into a four month program with the companies that we choose to invest in. And uh, in that program, we do two things. One is we identify the weaknesses in the entrepreneur and we address those skill gaps. And the other part is we identify the weaknesses in their business model and we identify that as well. And how we do that is, um, you know, as a team, we get directly involved a lot in the general mentorship from, you know, scratch to actually launching yourself into the market, as well as a lot of the business development part, especially for um, people that have B2B businesses in, in Bahrain. Um, but then on the other hand, we've also got a network of over 500 mentors across the region, a lot of whom are um, extremely uh, high specialists in a particular, particular niche topic. So for example, with say marketing and growth hacking, we have a guy who was the head of digital marketing for Kareem, who's a personal mentor in our program. So you get the leading experts, which kind of uh, helps you from having any sort of uh, major mistakes or pitfalls along the way. So it reduces your risk of failure um, by being uh, invested in by us and going through our program. And uh, an example of some of the people that benefited from that. Um, so we've got Hussein Haji, who's actually from the first cycle of investments we did. And then yes. we have Ali Mezra, who's uh, from the current cycle of investments we did. And you'll be able to ask them questions um, from the perspective of an entrepreneur of how they benefit from these kind of mechanisms. Yes, sure. We'll, uh, we'll ask Hussein, Taman, as a graduate from Plastic Lab, and also Ali as current, let's say, uh, taking program with you from their perspective, what kind of support they are receiving from that Plastic Lab. Let me go now to uh, Nawaf and ask him about Tinmo and how Tinmo also is really providing support to entrepreneurs. Um, thank you very much uh, for inviting us to talk uh, to this uh, masterclass. Um, uh, so basically Tenmu is an angel investment company. Um, they started in 2011, uh, a group of 16, uh, let's say entrepreneurs. Um, they're, they're successful businessmen and business, uh, from come, they come from business families and also uh, from the private sector, put in a million dinars uh, to support and invest in local startups. Uh, the concept back then in 2011 uh, so was was totally different than what we what we have right now. Um, to, in 2011, um, so every year uh, we have a, an investment committee and then we decide in investing in ideas. So a group of maybe 30, 40 uh, entrepreneurs come to Tenmo and then uh, present their ideas to us and then we grant them a check of 30, uh, 20 or 30,000 BD, and then we uh, joined them in starting these uh, companies. Um, after uh, 2000 and let's say three years ago, maybe 2018, uh, the, the, the whole uh, startup ecosystem uh, was formed thanks to Tim Keen, the EDB, and one of these uh, pillars uh, in the startup ecosystem is Fat Success. So you have the, the, the accelerators and then you have the angels and then you have the VCs coming all in and supporting the startup. So we decided to change our model and we decided to invest in tech companies because they're the future and they require um, less. Uh, so so, so the, the, the equity and all of that changed. Um, they require less follow up. We don't need to start the companies with them. Uh, we can come uh, in, in a later stage uh, rather than coming in the idea stage, which is very risky. And uh, so we change our model and Tenmu, the 2.0 Tenmu invests in tech startups. They invest in seed, pre-seed startups. 
um, we take equity from two to ten percent, and mm -hmm. we invest anything from. Um, uh, so, so our average ticket sizes range from, uh, let's say, fifteen thousand dollars to uh, around hundred thousand dollars, and uh, we go into the companies where they're valued at around five hundred thousand dollars to two point six million dollars. Um, so the whole idea changed. Um, mostly we we so the startup ecosystem is, is a very connective or connected ecosystem. We we tend to uh, invest in startups that graduate from Flat6 Labs because they've been in a program, they've done their tests and they've already incorporated and they have their MVPs, they have um, a good track record and they're ready to 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 go on to the next level. So we give them um, their 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 cash or uh, of a runway of maybe six to 12 months. And that gives them another uh, push to seek other investors um, from from Bahrain. We launched also um, a program called the Investors Education Program, which mm -hmm. is a collaboration between us and Tim Keen. So um, since we launched Tenmo 2.0, we've seen that um, we uh, the, the ecosystem lacks angels. These really uh, yes. successful yes. entrepreneurs that want I believe come. that you are the only one angel in Bahrain, right? right? Um, no actually, other. no, there, there are two, I think, uh, but we're the first and we're the first in the region, actually. So, so, so we've, we've noticed that there is a gap in the market for angels and we said there is money in Bahrain. Let's go and hunt these angels and, and train them and mm -hmm. uh, get them involved in, in the startup ecosystem. So Tim Keen, uh, supported us and uh, and sponsored the, the the first pilot program where we trained and uh, we we trained 10 uh, angels and from these 10 uh, angels there was a commitment that they would invest in a, a, a minimum of one startup uh, during this year and next year uh, with a, mm -hmm. a ticket size of ten thousand dollars uh, dinars, and alhamdulillah, after three months from the program, we managed to 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 actually uh, co-invest uh, in one of the startups that we invested in. So a graduate from the uh, angel or the investors development program and Tenmu went in and invested together in an app uh, that is recently launched. So. There is this uh, culture that is happening in Bahrain. Um, maybe it's different than the ones in in in, in the states and in the region. However, yeah. um, we we as Tenmu and the 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 whole ecosystem is here to, to support uh, the ecosystem. And Tim Keen definitely and EDB um, is is doing uh, such a great uh, job in keeping everything together. Uh, I think the universities can do more. Uh, yep. Universities should be the 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 the, the whole. Um, uh, I don't know um, the, the so so they hatch these entrepreneurs uh, and they 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 they're like the feeders for us to invest in. But I think we're lacking that. Um, I think universities should should promote more. Um, uh, starting a business and maybe uh, starting something that uh, investors would invest in and then maybe that idea and that company would go uh, into flat six labs and then graduate from that and then tenmu can invest in and then we bring a, a businessman uh, or a businesswoman and and we can co-invest and do a follow-on uh, funding so i think we could we could do more with the universities i think Saleh can can add to that and then thank you very much. If you have any questions, please let me know. Yes. I'll, I'll read the, yes. the chat. 
Certainly, yes. Um, uh, Saleh, if you would like to elaborate on the role of universities, and since you have mentioned the universities, then I would love to go to Professor Abdullah, uh, maybe then elaborate on this point uh, about the role of the university. As fair uh, Nawaf explanation, you said you are completing what starts a plastic lab is doing. So they want to start with plastic lab, and then they want to graduate from plastic lab, and they want to go to ten more. And also you said maybe the university, they should be the prerequisite of all of that. And if we, before going to plastic lab, we have to prepare our students like masters or undergrad to go to plastic lab and then to get the chance maybe with Tinmu and Tamkina and others. So and I would like to ask Professor Abdullah if you would like to elaborate on this point and the role of universities to produce entrepreneurs or potential entrepreneurs. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me and uh, I'm very, very happy to participate in this master class. And uh, I'm always, you know, uh, happy when I meet with entrepreneurs, you know, because I think it's one of the most important things these days, you know, that uh, universities used to be you know, evaluated based on the number of jobs, you know, the, which we call the employment only. Uh, but now, يعني, universities are evaluated according to how many entrepreneurs, those who make jobs rather than, you know, fitting a job. For this reason, really, uh, I think, you know, uh, it's really, uh, a, 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 first of all, great uh, opportunity for all the students in your class to be listening uh, at this very, very important experience of all these people, you know. And I think, you know, uh, Bahrain, although it's a very small country relatively, maybe the size of it, the number of population, but we do have, you know, uh, entrepreneur very famous you know i always uh, remember the stories of uh, janahi with the logistics uh, you know i was so uh, she, she impressed me when she saw me one of yes. her uh, you know transportation of i think whales or something from uh, place to place and others, you know, I always think of myself as an entrepreneur when I think of Ahliya University uh, project, you know, in 1991 when this project started, I remember everybody was against it, not because they don't believe in a university, they said it's too difficult. And I remember the ex-minister uh, of education used to tell me, are you crazy? You want to make a university, this is this and this, governments cannot do it. And look, you know, the university uh, have graduated more than 5,000 students and some of them are great entrepreneurs, you know. You know, uh, for this reason, I am really happy, you know, to have to be a part of this class and to listen to these entrepreneurs who really make us proud, you know. I always also remember a story, I always say it, you know, about a Bahraini uh, who was behind the idea of Windows, you know. It was a Bahraini in the early 70s who used to work in a computer company, very small at that time, and he started a project called Nafide, you know. So, and then Microsoft have bought the idea from him and started Windows. And you know, trillions of dollars Windows, you know. It's the idea of a young Bahraini originally. So, what I'm saying, especially when it comes to soft skills, you know, we can do as much as big countries. So, I really take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Angie, to thank everybody in this uh, class. And uh, I feel really that this is, you know, what will uh, give these students, the, the master class, the incentive of doing something, you know, when, when you bring them these very bright examples. So thank you very much. And I think, you know, 
uh, in sha Allah, you will have a very uh, good uh, MBA class with all these extraordinary guests. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Ambala. Thank you so much. I will go to Mr. Hussain now, uh, since he's graduated from Plastic Lab. And if you want to share with us his experience on how Plastic Lab helped him to take his business to an upper level, to the international level. Can you share your experience with our MBA students and also elaborate on how uh, the ecosystem is really supporting entrepreneurs today in Bahrain? Sure. So first off, uh, thank you for having me. Second, um, I apologize for logging in a bit late. It's, I've had some technical no difficulties with logging in. Uh, anyway, so uh, real quick, we we actually, I'm, I'm, first off, my name is Hassan Haji. I actually run a startup. I'm a serial entrepreneur, so to speak. So I've launched multiple businesses, managed to fail in a couple and successfully exit from two. And I'm currently running my fifth startup, which was uh, accelerated by Flat Six Labs Bahrain. Uh, when we started, though, uh, I mean, I, I would like to come back very quickly first to to a cup to a point where you said that uh, uh, the first step for a startup is an accelerator, second step is an angel, and that, that's not actually the case. An accelerator comes with it, uh, somewhere in the in between, uh, and then obviously goes to an actual investment. Angel investors are usually the first people to uh, to to invest in an idea or back an individual. So ideas are just ideas; they're usually the cheapest thing on the planet. Uh, it's mm -hmm. about the individual initially, and then angel investors come in and invest. And then obviously, when some traction, market traction is achieved, you are actually able to go to an accelerator such as Plat6 Labs and get uh, fund funded, uh, obviously, and uh, you know taken to the next level by that by that accelerator. When we joined Flat6 Labs, they they were very. I mean, obviously, we were the first. Uh, uh, cohort in Bahrain to join Flat6 Labs. So we were, so, so to speak, uh, some, somewhere around the lines of a guinea pig, more or less. They were, there was a lot of testing happening with us. Uh, and, and we loved that because startups anyways was all about testing and experimenting going forward. And mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the best part about Flat6 Labs is like, like Saleh mentioned, is they're connected to several countries and they're able to connect you to where you, you, you could actually see your business uh, flourish or, or, th or thrive, obviously, going forward. Also, when you're looking at raising uh, funding and investment, because Flat6 Labs and accelerators generally are in investing in the startup and own equity with the startup, they actually see value in helping you or supporting you and raising further funding going forward. And they would actually introduce you to uh, venture capital firms and, and funds and, uh, and and so on and so forth. Um, now, we started our journey with uh, get, getting an investment at a such very early pre-seed stage uh, for, from, from uh, Bahrain Development Bank. And we actually worked, uh, worked, they actually invested in us. And we actually worked going forward and reached a level where we, Flat6 Labs saw value in what we're doing, saw that there's strength in our team and contributed and joined and basically invested with us to help accelerate us. Uh, we saw ourselves after graduating from Plat6 Labs raise further funding from the likes of 500 startups, Azan Venture Capital and Faith Capital owned by Mohammed Jafar, ex Talabat owner in Kuwait. And then we went on forward to reach a valuation of over $7 million where we actually re uh, the, raised around $1.2 million from further H&Is and uh, investors going, uh, you know, going forward. So we've mm -hmm. seen a nice growth journey going forward from, from where, where we started to where we were. And Flat6 Labs definitely were part of that journey going forward. Accelerators usually play a very vital role in that growth. Uh, the ecosystem has been extremely supportive. Tim Keen did a fantastic job. Obviously, Tim Keen is, all, we always say Tim Keen is a blessing when it comes to uh, owning or running a business. The reason being is because there are so many expenses that, that the startup is usually, you know, uh, burdened by in the beginning. And for you to be able to, you know, take yourself from zero to one, you've got to have some sort of support scheme. Even though funding comes in, even if it's a small, like a little bit of money, $32,000 from is, is usually not enough to run a very successful and thriving business. You need some sort of support in, for example, salaries. Tenkin offered us that support in terms of covering 50% to 75% of salaries in some cases of Bahraini employees, which actually promotes hiring Bahrainis and training Bahrainis going forward, uh, university graduates or not. Um, and the, obviously, other than that, Tenkin's programs when it comes to supporting in marketing, supporting in, 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 in whatever other program that comes in, accounting and auditing as well, they actually pay for that uh, and support us in that. And that really, uh, you could say, relieved the large, a huge burden from, from, the, from us and allowed us to grow and understand further and experiment more with what we're doing to reach to where we are right now. 
which mm -hmm. is a platform called Deluni. Now, our platform, Deluni, is basically owned by our company, Inigrab. What Deluni does is empowers youth to get access to a source of income by selling products for businesses. So a business uploads their products onto the platform. Individuals get access to that platform. They sign up as sales agents. They can refer them using what they do best, which is social media and communication channels by sending a link. Somebody buys it, they make a commission. So in a sense, we allow the 30% of youth in the entire MENA region who are unemployed. So there was a point mentioned by a professor earlier that uh, saying that uh, you know, technology is going to take a lot of the job, a lot yeah. of the jobs from you, and mm -hmm. that is that is a fact. But th then again, you forget that there is something we call the gig economy. The gig economy is companies like Kareem, Uber, uh, uh, Upwork.com, uh, Freelance.com, Fiverr.com, and obviously us. So what, what happens is we allow people to get access to a source of income without having to leave their chairs and leaving their homes. They can actually spend six, seven hours a day trying to refer stuff and make money instead of having to have a full time job behind a desk and reporting to someone. So uh, that, that kind of like supports that sort of uh, that, that sort of shift to, to uh, a more digital uh, uh, to a transformation, even when it comes to the job market. Uh, not to talk, I mean, I, 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 this might sound a bit controversial, uh, but uh, when it comes to a prerequisite for startups to launch, I don't think yeah. a prerequisite is a university degree. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm talking to with, 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 with universities. This might again, this might seem a bit a bit a bit off here, but university degrees are definitely something that help people get a sort sort of education, get some sort of a grip on potentially getting a job and acquiring a position. And then from that, from there, they can actually acquire skills and it's always skill based, acquire skills from because of the university degrees that gave them access to a job. They acquired the skills, grew with those skills, and then they figured out, hey, you know what? I have a solution to a problem that exists in the world. So let me make a startup or a business uh, and let me utilize all that education. I had all those skills I built because of the fact that education opened doors for me. And then I can take a step forward and create my startup. So I don't think it's a prerequisite. Mm -hmm. It's, but I think it's definitely a plus in some cases. Mind you that one okay. in every three billionaires in the world, one in every three billionaires does not have a university degree. They started without university degree. So I don't want to, I, I just wanted to clear that off, off there. And again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't go to university. Don't quote me on this. What I'm saying is uh, it's not def definitely not a prerequisite. And I think that's that so in, in terms of the support that we get. We are happy. We're doing fantastic. And I think the best thing for you to do is if, if you're launching a startup is to go through an accelerator such as Flat6 Labs, approach 10 move for investment. And obviously you'd have to go with Tim Keen for, the, for, for support because it just wouldn't make sense if you don't. Thank you so much. So university certainly is playing the role, as you said, to prepare or to make those potential entrepreneurs be ready and well equipped with all the knowledge and skills required to be a successful entrepreneur. And uh, since you talked about technology and the importance of technology, and today we are witnessing uh, a paradigm shift due to this COVID-19 situation. COVID-19 overturned everything in our life, yani even personal or uh, uh, related to the professional level, yani from how companies they are operating, they are targeting or approaching their customers and the way to deliver it and so on. And I would like to ask Mr. Ali, since uh, uh, as part of his introduction, he said he's more focused on high tech or tech startups or tech entrepreneurs. Can you elaborate on what are the opportunities today for tech startups, for this new trend of tech startups, tech entrepreneurs, uh, either within the MENA, I mean locally or within the GCC or within the MENA region? Absolutely. Can you hear me well? Yes. Fantastic. Yes. Uh, yes. I was uh, thanking you for um, inviting us for this very esteemed uh, panel. I think I have a very um, soft spot for this discussion as uh, being uh, an MBA graduate myself and uh, later entrepreneur. So um, I kind of uh, put things in uh, context for me. Um, in regards yeah. to exactly your point, um, uh, Dr. Angie, I think uh, um, uh, we already touched on the um, role of uh, technology in the coming days and years uh, and how that is important now, right now, as we speak and in the future is going to be even uh, larger and not larger. Um, I think uh, the main uh, takeout uh, I'd like to uh, point at is the very particular position our region is at. Uh, we uh, have a very ripe uh, market for technology and, and digital 
services in uh, in the uh, Middle East and uh, MENA, uh, MENA region in general. Okay. And that is uh, because of our very char uh, characteristic uh, culture and society that um, uh, we are the best people to find uh, solutions and, and services in comparison to others. And uh, the best examples are uh, Kareem that is at the moment um, uh, is competing with uh, Uber uh, in the Middle East that Uber was forced to uh, acquire that and a few other examples. And this is this is a global trend. It's not only for our region, but there are others that actually are ahead of us, like in the Asian uh, region. Uh, there, uh, there is a particular emphasis on uh, uh, providing uh, solutions for our own region. Uh, what I'm trying to get to is that uh, our students um, uh, very uh, nicely positioned to be able of thinking through that uh, particularity about our region and coming up with uh, um, uh, with the uh, solution from our own community. Like uh, the, the, the work that uh, the likes of uh, Mr. Haji is uh, doing and others is going to be far more effective if it considers the um, cultural, the social, the, um, uh, the, the lingual uh, characteristics of uh, our society. Uh, th that is perhaps maybe uh, why um, uh, us as ADRI, uh, we are a New Zealand company, uh, ended up um, proudly now becoming a, a Bahraini company. That's simple, uh, simply because we uh, identified the gap, uh, particularly in our uh, social uh, markets. And um, uh, from uh, the end of the world in New Zealand, the 17 hours apply to the, the best place that we could um, uh, we could come to was uh, Bahrain and and particularly there were um, I'd like to make a connection to the discussion uh, about the um, the ecosystem uh, particularly yeah, yeah. the uh, the attraction for us to come to Bahrain was the very um, assistive and very um, uh, supportive uh, ecosystem that uh, the, the Bahraini government has put together and uh, that uh, includes, uh, of course, Tamkeen, um, EDB, uh, and now we are uh, gladly uh, part of uh, Flat6 Labs and, and others. And of course, I acknowledge uh, 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 Nawaf and Tenwu and others. That is unique in the region. Um, so we were looking into other options uh, around the GCC particularly, but uh, we weren't able to find any competing option. And, and, and frankly, uh, uh, in comparison to Temkin uh, uh, in the specific. The model that Temkin and EDB put together um, for uh, the businesses in, the, uh, in Bahrain are uh, mm -hmm. quite distinctive. Now, um, to, to, to close off, I'd like to definitely uh, make that remark that, um, and, and this is coming from a, a very similar uh, case as myself to your students uh, that uh, now that uh, uh, the students are graduating and going into the uh, workforce, not necessarily they have to pull the hat off and they go and start the idea right away. Um, uh, like um, I personally uh, share my own experience that I went into the market, I uh, worked for a few uh, major companies for five, six years and learned exactly about the different uh, applicability of your studies and your concepts and your uh, and the achievement that you've done into your academic uh, academic days, but then at uh, the same time you build upon um, a leadership uh, uh, drive in how to actually take things in your own hand and not only just do it, uh, do what um, um, others uh, expect uh, you are able to do, but actually help others as well to excel uh, uh, as well and create opportunities for others. So I'm very pleased mm -hmm. that um, the Ahli is actually thinking ahead uh, in this sense. And this shows, um, um, in contrary to what um, uh, perhaps maybe um, Nawaf and uh, Saleh were highlighting about the uh, connection between the universities, but I think what Ahli is doing is actually that step forward, and I wish other universities would be able to do that. Uh, I'll be pleased for any questions yeah. uh, as well. Thank you so much, and I would like to open the floor for the students if they would like to ask any question to our panel. Waiting for the students to interact with us and to ask the students uh, to ask the questions to our panel. And I would like to just elaborate on the point 
mention of Dubai Nawaf and, uh, and here I have the three key players in the ecosystem. I have Tenmo, I have Tamkeen, and I have Lastix Lab. And you talked about a gap maybe between universities and the ecosystem from, let's say, the perspective of accelerators, incubator, and so on. In your perspective, and I would like to ask this maybe to start with Palah, how can we, let's say, bridge this gap? What universities should do in order to link uh, the graduate, master students or undergrad to accelerators, angels, VCs, and so on? Yeah, so I think the first step starts with like, um, you know, we've been trying to do it pretty actively over the past two years where we've been reaching out to all the faculty because we feel the faculty need to kind of be the ambassadors of the startup ecosystem. And so the first step is for us to try and get all the faculty proactively on board and uh, educated on um, A is the kind of support mechanisms, for example, the, the kind of offerings that Tankin has directly to support entrepreneurs as well as the accelerators and people like Tenmu, and just to give them like a general idea of um, the fact that it's not the way most people perceive it to be. So I think the biggest problem and the biggest barrier that a lot of people feel are those three things I mentioned, which is what we address, which is, you know, one is I don't want to risk my own capital uh, or my parents' capital, and then I fail and then it's all on me and, and I've got debt. So at least with this kind of model, it's a win-win, lose-lose scenario where, where you know, it's kind of risk free in the sense that you're not taking any financial debt on board when you're when mm -hmm. you're creating business. And I think that makes people feel a lot more confident when they're going into it. And of course, it's not like we're going to hand out that cash to anybody that comes along. It's, uh, it's like the, the actual ratio of people compared to applicants that end up getting invested in is only 2% of the total um, application pool. But uh, yeah, it's, it's also getting them to understand the skill set um, that the universities can start working on from the first year of uni to get people mm -hmm. to go into these kind of uh, into an entrepreneurship field. So definitely when it comes to the technical aspect, one of the biggest issues that we always face is that we have a lot of um, founders who they have the idea and they believe that they can take the approach of knowing how to do the business development and the marketing and they know mm -hmm. where their gap in the market lies, but they have no idea how to develop the product. So um, a lot of them, even they, they don't have a single friend in their group who's a developer. So that's the part where it, it holds them back a lot and it's a big barrier. And, you know, it leads to them having to look for other solutions like outsourcing development, usually to India or Ukraine or these kind of countries. But it's those skill, skill gaps that the universities really need to work on as well. So I'd say A is mm -hmm. um, once the faculty are aware of it, They'll also usually be able to they'll be able to identify the really strong students in their class that they probably feel like, oh, this guy's got some great ideas and he, he would probably be a good potential going forward. And, you know, they could advise them just to interact with us and then would be happy to carry the conversation from there. Um, and yeah, I'd say, I'd say that's the two main is one the faculty being able to educate them on the tools available and also finding the skill gaps that courses need to be created around to address. OK, thank you so much. What about uh, Tamkeen? Um, from your perspective, Ahmed, how can we, let's say, as I said, bridge the gap? Maybe prepare graduates to be entrepreneurs and to take the lead to, let's say, to apply for programs like the programs offered by Plastic Lab, Tinmo, and the other programs proposed by Tamkeen and EDB. So uh, I agree totally with what uh, my colleagues have been saying, especially Saleh uh, in his last comment. Uh, but if I, if I may add to that, I think one of the challenges that we have in Bahrain is uh, the number of startups. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and growing number of startups is one crucial thing that we have to do to help and support uh, entities like Fat6, Fats and others. Sometimes we've been working, we've been supporting all accelerators in Bahrain and we've been working closely with the uh, angel investments as well, and with the individual startups. We need, in, in order to be able to improve the startup uh, quality, I think we need more uh, number of startups in Bahrain. I think the role of universities today is not only to create awareness and education about uh, what startups need, but in addition to that, we need to encourage students while they are at university to to uh, to to actually start the businesses. I I think. I would hail Bahrain today for creating more incubators within the environment of the universities, but we need to activate those. And in order to activate mm -hmm. those, we need to encourage more students to start their journey while they are being students. We know that some of them may lose 
some of them may fail. But as Professor uh, Mansour mentioned earlier, failing is not the opposite of success. Failure is just one step toward that. And for the entire country to move forward, we need to, to, um, to encourage those, those uh, individuals to start their businesses. And of course, one of the other areas that Saleh mentioned, and, and I, I can't agree more with that, uh, one of the challenges that we have in Bahrain is the pool of talents. And that's another thing that we need to improve in order to help the, the, uh, the startups themselves to have uh, the right labor that they need uh, to come to Bahrain and to work in Bahrain and grow in Bahrain. Uh, today, everybody's, after COVID-19, everybody's talking about Team Bahrain. I think every single person in this planet is part of Team Bahrain. Because Team yeah. Bahrain is not just the people helping the sick people, it's the, the, the individuals here that are helping the economy as well. And I think every student in your master class can be an active member in the, in the, in the Team Bahrain by either creating awareness about what startups need, helping startups to grow with their research, becoming part of the startup community by starting their businesses and being accelerated by Flat6 Labs and others and going with ideas to entities like Tenmu or being partners with Ali and Hussein. I think that ecosystem for it to grow, that's part and a crucial part of Team Bahrain. That's the future of the country. Many people today are losing jobs, but as, as, as Professor Abdullah mentioned, we need people to create jobs as well. And that's probably the role of startups. Thank you so much. Uh, from Tenmu perspective now, uh, how can Tinmo potentially would create relationship with universities, just as I said, to support entrepreneurs, potential entrepreneurs? Mute, mute. Mute, no. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so definitely, um, Tenmo is here to support uh, the local ecosystem in any way possible. Definitely, we want to be more involved. Um, Due to the the COVID situation, we were supposed to, uh, prior to this uh, incident, we were supposed to uh, open up a platform with the universities for them to um, support us and and maybe uh, give an opportunity for university students to showcase their um, maybe startups or ideas in the Mini Angel uh, Investors uh, Summit which uh, Tenmo and Flat6 Labs are partnering. So um, showcasing uh, talents and, and, and students on stage uh, with uh, in front of uh, 300 uh, attendees and investors, that will give a push definitely to the students and, 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 and give them an understanding on how to pitch in front of an audience, um, how, how can they uh, develop their products further, um, what I like with uh, some of you universities uh, in America, uh, they embed uh, the, the whole um, entrepreneurship and uh, starting your own business in, in the actual uh, program. So once you start your, your, your bachelor's degree, uh, they provide you with a, a seed fund of, let's say, $5,000 and then uh, and then they expect you uh, once you graduate to have a fully fledged um, uh, company uh, with traction and 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 you developed it through through every year of of the program. So within the the four years program, you you get uh, to 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 test your product, to 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 acquire customers, to to get investors, and all of that. So uh, maybe Ahlia could. Uh, uh, think of a program such as uh, some of the universities in America. Uh, however, um, as Ali said, um, you're you're initiating this um, platform uh, is is definitely a step forward, uh, and wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Uh, let me now open the floor for the students to ask a question to the panel. Uh, our master students, we would like to hear from you. Uh, if you have any questions to the panel. I have my first question. Yes, go ahead, Yusuf. Turn it off. Yes. How has Tenmo managed to secure funds during the COVID-19 outbreak? Um, so, so, 
So basically, um, Tenmu, uh, our original uh, uh, fund is still available. Um, so the million dollars, uh, sorry, the million dinars, uh, we have some of that money in our account. So we we managed successfully to invest in two startups during the COVID situation in late uh, March. So um, we're still uh, keeping our commitment to serve and support the local ecosystem. Uh, maybe we we can't do our four full targeted five investments this year. How, however, two uh, we managed to do two, and we want to continue to to support as much as possible. We're still in talks with the uh, Flatsex Labs as we speak on other startups, and we'll, we, inshallah, uh, definitely by next year and the years to come, uh, we will definitely invest in more. Inshallah. Thank you. Inshallah. More questions? Students, they are here with us. Um, yes, I have a question. Yes, Ella. Go uh, ahead. Hi, all. Um, for now, like as as you can see, like if I if I launch a business or anyone does, like maybe the next day, ten people they will do the same. So, what's like what's the criteria to choose, or how can I distinguish my business and make it unique? Can I jump in real quick, please? Yes. 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 Yeah. So 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 regarding competition uh, and and basically first copiers. First off, I think you should be flattered if you launch a business and somebody copies you. That's number one. Uh, number two, if you know we have that issue here in Bahrain, as you can see out in the street, very publicly, when someone opens a shop, sixteen other shops doing the same exact thing open next to it. And, and and that's available everywhere. But then again, think if you are if you open a business and you're not able to execute properly, the person next to you or launch launches after you and copies you will allow you to perform better. Will allow you to compete and become and innovate and become more creative with what you do. I mean, that's at least what I believe. So, uh, giving in keeping in mind Kareem and Uber situation, which Ali mentioned earlier, Kareem launched in the region. And basically localized. All they did was, you know, cater to an Arabic environment. That, that's that's basically how it went. And when they did that, they did it so well that Uber in the end decided, couldn't compete with them locally. They did, they were forced to come in and acquire them for three point two, three point three billion dollars approximately. Yeah. So competition is not a bad thing. When someone copies you, it allows you to innovate. But do you have the first market advantage? That's the first and the first and foremost thing you have to keep in mind. You launched before them, so you know the market a little bit more. And you're able to actually iterate and pivot and change up and you know you probably saved some money from whatever you've made as profits. Hopefully you've made profits by that time that they copied you. I'm guessing that's the reason they would copy you anyways. So competition is healthy. Accept it, embrace it, innovate, be creative and become better. And that's the whole reason the, the whole reason, you know, in, in the end, everybody is here. Everybody here probably would be able to copy a business at some point. There is no there's a statistical impossibility that you're going to it's, it is a statistical impossibility. You're going to launch something that no one else have thought has thought about because we're like 7.8 billion people around the world anyways. So keep all that stuff in mind. You, whatever you're launching, if somebody copies you, just become better and, you know, move faster. Ali. Yes, Ali. <laughs> Yes, um, uh, uh, fantastic point, um, uh, Jose. I, I, I can't say uh, much more than uh, um, just one uh, point. I think uh, the difference between a successful entrepreneur at the at the end with uh, uh, um, uh, an, an unsuccessful entrepreneur is the innovation and the pivoting and the adaptation. And uh, uh, the competition is only one problem you're going to have. There are other problems along the way that the only way that you can exceed through those uh, uh, is to continue that innovation. The very initial time that you create the idea, that's the innovation moment. You have to keep it up. You don't you don't slow that down and continuously um, uh, innovate. <clears throat> Be creative. Like if the uh, competition is that strong, that creating a very strong uh, product like the one that you have, uh, if you keep innovating and being creative, you will be able to find another pivot, like what um, Hossein just mentioned, to um, uh, uh, to offer a better or something even more uh, than what you're offering at the moment. So it's the, the creativity and innovation that you have to keep up, and that's what makes you as a successful entrepreneur. 
Thank you, Ali, and thank you, Hussein. Other questions, guys? I have a question. Dr. Mahmoud. Yes, go ahead, Mahmoud. Thank you, yourself and the guest speaker for this amazing session. But I have a question. Suppose I have an idea, but I like certain expertise. Suppose an app development or regulation. What's the role of them, you know, that six lab or ten more in raising this? Who wants to answer, guys? So it's for ten keys, like six, seven, ten more. I didn't. I didn't hear the the question. I didn't understand. Repeat the question, Mahmoud. Suppose I have an idea, but I like a cer certain expertise. Suppose an app development or certain sure. location. For example, if if it, it was a financial app, so I need some uh, knowledge about the CBB ruling, but I like the expertise in, in this field. What's the role of Temkin and uh, Flat6 Lab in this? Well, I mean, with, with Flat6 Labs, uh, like we, we, we would be able to connect you with the people to speak to in the CBB, like particularly the lady that's in charge of the sandbox, who, who basically regulates all fintech startups. But I mean, we would want to see that you've gone out there and actually tried to find out how to fill that, that lack of skill. Where we come in is when it comes to you being at a prototype stage usually, and like you've already You've already got a, a working, not a fully functional product, but something that it's like what we call a mi minimum viable product, which is where you have something that just at least validates um, what, what your solution is trying to do and the demand that's out there in the market. Um, and then from there, we will bring in like fintech as experts and uh, we'll bring in mentors and everything to make sure that any skill gap that, that you don't have is addressed. Um, but another thing to keep in mind is what what we always want to see from entrepreneurs is the mindset that there is no reason to feel that there's a barrier right like there's always a way around everything even even without us we're we're there to come on board and to help you grow we're called an accelerator because we're there to speed things up basically we're there to like reduce your risk and to try and get you to grow a lot faster and get you to market quicker and to get you to grow quicker but at the same time, you should always feel that you, you have the, the ability within yourself to also reach out to people in the CBB to find out wh whatever that lack of knowledge is to be able to address it. And then you come to guys like us who, like, like uh, Hussein was saying, uh, we're not necessarily the, the immediate first step. We're the guys you come to once you've taken those first steps of speaking to the CBB, figuring out if, you're, if your solution is going to work or not. And then you come to an accelerator and say, hey, guys, you know, here's my business model. Great. Uh, Fazer, I think you have a question, right? Hi, everyone. I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, can hear you. Can you hear me? Um, yes. How to cope with challenges in the business world, especially after COVID-19? Repeat the question, Fazer. How to cope with challenges in the business world, especially after COVID-19? Have to co how to cope with challenges uh, after the COVID-19. I believe yes. Hussein and Ali maybe they will answer because they are uh, they have stopped out and they have a company, so they can back answer the truck. <laughs> yes, Hussein, go ahead. Sure. So I've, I've been blessed with a startup that has been growing during the COVID situation. So we've actually been successfully growing our performance and, and, and uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's kind of like we've tripled our sales last month. We've doubled the sales month before and we're doing, we're doing a pretty good job in that sense. But I can tell you that the best, best option for any startups, for example, I know a couple of startups and I can name them that, that actually uh, uh, are suffering during this situation because their main business involves people going outside. And that's that, that. That is the, the I think the core situation here that they cannot that that, that kind of like create creates a barrier for them because no one can go and you know do some activities and whatnot. For example, playing soccer or football out there. But then that's why we pivot. So the main way to be able to cope with COVID nineteen during the, during during that this this whole situation and pandemic as it just eases out and goes away is to pivot. As Ali mentioned earlier, you have to be able to change your startup and adapt to whatever is going on in the situation right now. Uh, so a lot of startups that uh, allow you to book, for example, sports venues uh, have pivoted into the developing sports content and video content for people to work out from home. And they charge for that video content in a sense, generating some sort of revenue for them to maintain their runway, which Nawaf mentioned in the chat as, as a major challenge of startups during the COVID situation. Yeah. So 
Pivoting is as, is is key. You're the ability the ability to adapt. Every uh, the issue with startup founders that they usually have is they always look at themselves as, hey, I am I own this idea and I love my idea so much. There's no way I'm going to change it. But that's not the case. You have to understand that the market determines the success of your idea. And if your idea is not successful, then it's not successful. You got to be able to pivot real quick and iterate and get to a point where you can make it successful. Especially in situations such as COVID and whatnot. Ali, you want to elaborate on this point? Yes. Especially uh, when it comes to technology, maybe, and when it comes to businesses sure, or startups sure, related sure. to tech world. Yes. I think, I think um, I, I'll pick on your very uh, um, valid uh, point technology. Um, I think um, uh, COVID 19 is only uh, one crisis that we are, uh, at the moment have. Uh, we have to, to get prepared for a lot of, uh, um, God forbid, of course. And, and inshallah, not, uh, nothing, uh, uh, nothing happened like that, or even close to that. But um, this is uh, this is normal life. Um, uh, uh, God forbid we can go outside and um, get hit by a car, and you know you, you have an in injury. That again is going to be an equal impact. The point is that um, there, there are always these issues and uh, the the problems for the businesses. Um, the good thing is that technology enables you to uh, go around a lot of these issues. Um, uh, the difference uh, at the moment uh, with the COVID-19 is a physical presence, which uh, thankfully um, the visual communication uh, has solved it 10, 20 years ago. And we are uh, now blessed as what we're doing right now. Uh, uh, this is exactly the core of the business that uh, we're talking about. Uh, and AI and machine learning is going to, uh, as a company that we adopt AI and machine learning quite in depth, uh, is going to uh, transform the business uh, doing quite fundamentally. And um, you students are the best people to uh, learn about it, not necessarily as a developer, but even as an MBA, as a business owner, um, um, AI and machine learning is in the core of uh, what uh, you have to learn uh, more about and adopt in the uh, in the future, particularly. So I think um, uh, COVID-19 is only one crisis ahead. Thank you so much. I can see also beautiful interaction between our panel and the, uh, the students through chat. And uh, yes, I can see a few questions coming to Nawaf and to uh, also Ahmed. Uh, Huda, can you share your questions with all of us, please? I, I saw a question on um, the chat which is to Nawaf, I believe. Uh, can you go ahead, Huda, please? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, Ali, Ali, and Hassan, I think. How did you uh, forecast the initial budget for developing uh, your application? I just, I just replied. Sorry. Can I <laughs> oh, <no>. interrupt? <laughs> Sorry, uh, Dr. Angie, thank you very much, but I have to excuse myself. Um, uh, and uh, good luck. Thank you so much. It was very nice having you. If we have, we'll have any other questions, we'll forward it to you. Awesome. So real quick about uh, about forecasting and budgeting. Uh, I just replied, I responded by saying whatever budget for you actually your budget for, the most definitely you're going to need more. It's a fact, right? So almost every startup founder, whether they're fresh or not, they always manage to forget or not account for something that are unforeseen, that's unforeseen. Because in the end, it's unforeseen. It's an unforeseen circumstance. So in some cases, we budget that we're going to require a, like a budget of $100,000 to get this up and moving. But in reality, for an entire period of a year, for example, but in reality, we, we, we end up spending that $100,000 in the first six months. Because we've seen growth and we get excited and we start spending and we just continue spending, we need to hire we think that developers are going to cost us this much, but in reality, developers are going to cost us much more, and the market just continuously fluctuates, and you cannot you cannot measure that, and you cannot you know anticipate all of that. So uh, that's why a lot of startup founders do not make up a business plan before launching their startup. The actual document of business plan. It's more of a pitch, mm -hmm. more of a more of a, a, a pitch format, more of an investor deck we call it, which is something that uh, that involves numbers and all those those you know projections that are go, that go back and forth that could potentially happen or not happen. Because in the end, startups are all about uncertainty, and I think Ali could elaborate as well. 
Absolutely. Um, so I think uh, um, I, I speak from uh, the tech uh, perspective. For a tech startup, um, you uh, have a quite a very clear um, kind of like uh, trajectory in your uh, business development. And that's the first step is, of course, the idea. And the second step is, as um, uh, Saleh uh, just alluded, uh, have been a prototype. Uh, now, from the idea to prototype, uh, it's often uh, uh, dependent on the team itself. So uh, we have to emphasize that um, um, entrepreneurship is not a, uh, is not an individual um, discussion. It's it's often far more successful if it's within a team. So having a team is uh, is definitely one of the fundamentals for getting a successful uh, startup off the ground. Now, if you have an idea. Uh, just make sure, like uh, the um, question just the gentleman asked about where to find the answer about a particular pro uh, problem that he doesn't have the expertise. Find the entrepreneur yeah. like yourself and team up who has that expertise. Now, once you get those uh, right skills together, two, three, four of you uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen together, then you will be able to uh, understand what does it take to create the prototype. That's the first step for forecasting because you have the skills, you know who uh, doing what, and then you put it together your thoughts. At that stage, um, uh, most probably if you are a team, you don't really need a lot of money to get to the prototype because you yourself are doing the things. And if you need further help, then the ecosystem in, in Bahrain is fantastic enough to get you um, the, the right uh, answers. Um, uh, in my opinion, uh, at the idea stage, the university itself is very fundamental that can help you as well. Like, for example, just pull uh, your uh, professor and ask him, what do you think is going to take for building uh, these uh, kind of uh, these three, four functions for the prototype? So, yes, the forecast, it all depends on the amount of efforts required for creating uh, the prototype. And once you have the prototype, then you can e expand your uh, your um, uh, vision and get the help from uh, the likes of Flat Six Labs. Tim Keen, of course, it's not only Tim Keen, it's not only just providing money and, and, and all that, but they actually broker those discussions. Like uh, there are so many programs that they can help you even from the very initial idea stage as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Mariam, I can see that she has a question. Mariam, please go ahead. Mariam? Yes, Mariam definitely. not ready yet. Yes. Can yes. you share your question with the panel, please? I think he answered my question already. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Very much. Great. Victor, I have a question, if you yes. don't mind. Yes, go so, ahead. Salah, so how has the incubator, such as Flat Six Labs, aided their clients during the, this pandemic, the COVID-19? <laughs> Um, yeah, so with the pandemic, there's like a few things that we, we had to work around because it's uh, also affected the way we usually do our business as well. Um, so, for example, one thing we did was we tied in a partnership that we had worked on with Zane. And then Zane, at the same time, they were also trying to figure out a way of how they could contribute to their users who are all stuck at home nowadays. And so then we came up with a campaign where we could promote um, a majority of most of our B2C uh, solutions where they would tie in and give like a special offering to Zane customers. At the same time, Zane would use their extreme extensive network to basically promote that uh, company, which ended up resulting in them getting a lot more uh, consumers onboarded. And uh, another thing we did was, for example, we found out usually we do our demo days as a physical thing. And it's actually one of the biggest events that happened of the year. Ahmed's come to many of them. Um, and uh, so, you know, we, we had we, we tried to really make it like an entertaining kind of theatrical show for a few reasons. One is our, our job isn't just to kind of put the startups on display, but it's also to get all the um, community and especially the business families, high network individuals and even the students, for example, we invite everybody to come in and we want to make it uh, really entertaining in a way that people get engaged and they want to get involved in this industry whether it's as an investor or entrepreneur. So this got canceled a week before we, it was meant to happen. And usually this is like about two months of planning for these uh, events. 
So then, then we were like, okay, how are we going to still have value to our startups have now finished the program and now we need to give them this platform, but the way we used to do it is gone. So, um, so what we did was uh, we, we ended up uh, renting a studio and we, I honestly could say that what we did in Bahrain, it was the first for Plastics Labs in the region to do a digital demo day. And it was the first I've seen even globally compared to, you know, huge companies like 500 and tech stars and all that. They were doing very basic, like the way we're interacting now, where it was basically someone pitching from their webcam and everything. We chose to make it, again, bring that entertainment. Yeah. We knew that it was during Ramadan, so we wanted to have it like after iftar that that everyone can sit down and watch it with their family so we rented a studio we made it almost like uh, america's got talent kind of uh yeah. format the production quality was like top notch and um we ended up getting a much wider reach so we usually at uh, demo day we get around 500 people or so uh during this we we got a reach we knew that we had 2,000 people watching from devices a lot of whom they were watching it from TVs at the time as well. So we don't know how many in total the viewership was because some of them, they're even in, in the living room, their families and things like that. But we ended up getting uh, the good part of it was we got a lot of people reaching out to us that we had never met before from angel investors, uh, investment companies in Saudi. And so we managed to connect the uh, founders with a bigger network than we usually would uh, in, a, in during the traditional times. Now, the other part that was the first thing for us was going into the next cycle where we had to, we usually our program is always in our offices in the MBB tower and this time we went remote. But in a way, what we found was the, the, the uh, you know, originally I think everybody at the beginning, they feel does the digital format really work as well as the physical format? Are people as engaged? Are they going to learn and absorb as much? Um, but what we found was that over time, I guess people have adapted to it. And we have a higher attendance rate uh, through the virtual uh, format than we did when it was a physical one. And at the same time, we've been able to bring in much um, harder to reach experts because we don't have to fly people in anymore. They can they can basically log on to their PC and they've started doing one on one consultations that wouldn't have happened um, as often as it does now. So uh, in a lot of aspects, I think it's improved the overall quality of the program and at the same time it's saved a lot of time of you know going back and forth and physically having to travel in between meetings where they've been able to have a lot more free time to work on their on their businesses as well during during that time very nice okay Mark i have a time. question um, yes, first question is for ahmed uh, what kind of support usually Tim King can give for small startups? Uh, like, um, does it cover like the shop or the, as you said, the salaries and so on? Like, what it's usually it covers? And another question is, is for you all guys. Like, do you think, um, halas, we're gonna remote? Um, like, everything gonna be virtually and uh, no longer we will need like uh, physical shops and so on. Everything gonna be like on applications and websites. Uh, what's your point of view about this? Um, I will start with Ahmed, yeah. Sure. So if I may answer that, uh, I'll start answering that. Let me start with a note, a general note on some of the questions that have been seen in the chat and some of the answers that my colleagues have been giving, which I totally agree with all of it. But one thing the students and, and the, the audience today should understand, and I'm sure they do, is that there is no single point that Hussein or Ali or any of us had the answers for every single question that may come up to our minds. We always have that unknown part of the startups. Taking yeah. risk is a crucial part of being an entrepreneur. And to call Hussein and Ali entrepreneurs, it means they've been through sleepless nights just to think, are we going to fail or succeed? There is no formula of success. So it's always the matter of continuously trying to improve their ideas, trying to figure out what to do without having 100% guarantees of what they've been doing. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So if, if I knew honestly what's the answer and what's going to work out in the coming three to six months, I would make I would make millions uh, instead of here being here talking to you only. Uh, so, so these are all unknown questions. Uh, yes, we can think together. We know that technology is working, but why Zoom 
did great while some other uh, online platforms did not. Uh, so these are all unknown questions that they need to think of as they grow and go forward. Uh, to go back to your questions, if I want to answer what Temkin does, uh, it's, it's wrong to think of Temkin as, as a, an entity that provides a program called business development that supports 50% of marketing, although we do. We support. We have a program called business development that's suspended now because we're thinking about business continuity rather than business development. But uh, it, it's wrong to think of Temkin as a company or an entity, an organization that provides a specific support. I think we look at ourselves as enablers. We're part of Flat Six Labs. So whenever you're talking great about what Saleh and the team does there, we're happy because we think it's a partnership. Whenever we see Hussein or Ali doing great in the market, we believe that we're partners with them, not with shares, but the success of the entire ecosystem for us in Temkin is our success as well. Uh, so what Temkin does basically, Temkin, as the name suggests, we're enablers. We try to enable the entire community in order to achieve their goals uh, within the entrepreneurial ecosystem, of course. Uh, so we do have programs. You may visit our, our website, temkin.ph, and you can see those programs. But think of us beyond that. When Ahliya are happy with their program, with their entrepreneurship program, we believe that it is our success as well. It is our achievement as well. Because again, we're a crucial part of the entire ecosystem. I know I did not answer your, your question in details. It's just the notion of don't think of Temkin as an organization that provides certain programs. Think of us as your partners in whatever you wish to do. Uh, if I may give one, I, one suggestion to, to uh, the students, if they are thinking or they are inspired tonight or by this uh, entire master program, uh, mm -hmm. two things. One is, please, if you have an idea, try it out. Small scales, start small, don't put uh, all of your eggs in one basket, of course. Don't go so big at the beginning. I know it's a tough time, but at these tough times, the risk is higher, so the, the gains are higher as well. And the second thing, Hussein and Ali and the other entrepreneurs and Saleh from the community, can be great mentors for you to start. And I'm sure everybody in our community are very friendly and helpful and they can help you to, to take this. Yes. True. Thank you, Ahmed. Ahsen and Ali. Ahsen and I saw also one other question in the chat. One of the students is asking you to elaborate a little bit on your business. Sure. Uh, so so I'll give you a brief story of how we came up with the idea of the Looney. So before the Looney, initially we went, uh, we actually visited a couple of big telcos in, in, in Bahrain and we were trying to sell a different product through their sales sales teams. And though they responded that we would love to, but uh, the issue is that we have a shortage in our sales team and we'd rather, you know, we, we so we cannot take that, that plat, you know, that's the, that extra step of selling for you. And uh, that kind of put us in a, in a weird situation. And we're like, what kind of shortage? They're like, we have 30, 40 employees in our sales department, but we actually need 100, 150 to be able to settle that pipeline. And my response was very, like, I blurted it out. I'm like, you guys make, you know, pay dividends tw twice a year. Why do you have the cash to hire more people? Why don't you hire more people? And like, we'd rather not bear the liability of paying salaries. Now, being an entrepreneur, when I hear the word, when I hear the word liability next to people, it just doesn't make sense to me because, you know, for me, an individual is always an asset and unless they're, you know, underutilized or overutilized. So mm -hmm. that's when I thought, you know what, I want to fix this. So I, I went back to the office, sat down with my co-founder and we're like, you got, we're going to shop everything and try to fix this. And we created a platform where we allowed those same businesses to upload products and list their services or products onto the platform and allows other people to basically log in and do what they do best at home. So when we sit together at, and with our families, we talk with them and tell them, hey, I, I, I just bought an iPad. I think it's really cool. Why don't you buy an iPad? And then this person buys the iPad and that's it. Nothing happens. Now picture doing the same thing, but then getting paid for it. So what happens is you, you find that iPad on the Looney and you go like, yep, yeah, I heard you want to buy an iPad. Then you send you a link. And I just send the link using WhatsApp. The person clicks the link, they open that link. And when they buy the product, you just made a commission because of that referral. And obviously the business is happy because they have, they have a pool of sales agents talking about their products and referring it for them. So it's a glorified referral scheme more or less. It's e-commerce with a, with a twist on referral. The best thing about the commission is it doesn't come in your wallet and you don't need to spend it in the loony. No, you can actually take it back as cash into your account, withdraw it and spend it wherever else you, wherever you want to spend. 
So uh, I heard Fajr want, wanting to know how you do that. It's really simple. You can just download the app on the App Store or Play Store. It's called Deluni. It's spelled D-A-L-O-N-I. And then when you download it, it's very seamless. It'll tell you exactly what you're supposed to do and, and it'll just take you step by step. If you have any issues, please, please do find me on LinkedIn. Text me. I always reply to, all the, all those, uh, to any text that comes in. I'll be more than happy to address those issues. We are launching a new version very soon as well. So I would love it if you guys uh, would, would be part of our testing, uh, you know, testing group as well. Right, very nice. So it's a good utilization of what we are calling word of mouth. Yes, absolutely. We monetize word of mouth. So uh, any other questions, guys, from the audience? Um, Dr. Angie, uh, I, if you don't mind, I uh, re yes, respond please. to the question, um, uh, one of uh, the kind of students. I, 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 unfortunately, I can't see the name of uh, the students. That's a problem, yes, I think. Here in the chat. Yes. That's why. So uh, one of the students was asking, um, how did the, the MBA I've done uh, um, uh, reflect in, in, in my journey as, uh, as an entrepreneur and as a person? <clears throat> so perhaps maybe I, I take you back a little bit uh, further. I'm, I'm actually a network engineer, so I'm a geek rather than a, um, a business person uh, previously. But uh, in 2010, I wanted to do something different. So I decided to go to the business school. Particularly, I was interested in strategic management and strategic uh, planning. So I went to the business school and did an MBA in that. Now, uh, later on, I realized that actually, uh, we talk about technology a lot at the operational level that how to use the laptop or how to fix the um, the server or how to fix the router and stuff like that. But uh, actually, nowadays, technology is making decisions for every bit of our life. So how to utilize that? I could only answer that uh, question when I did my MBA. That, um, OK, now that you, when you go into an MBA, you learn about how things are happening around you, particularly in the economy and, this, and, and the wider society as well. So I couldn't have done anything better than for my study. Um, now, when I look back at it, uh, because it provided us the bigger picture about how things run in, in general. And that's uh, I'm talking about a, a geek, um, uh, someone that uh, even having difficulties for communication with the MBA kind of like uh, opened up the horizon that uh, later on uh, I was able to excel in my own career as a technologist becoming an enterprise architect to um, decide stra strategies on technology for other uh, companies and, and beyond that then looking into how to actually utilize the knowledge I learned from the strategic management and the MBA I got into leading technology creation. And now, thankfully, um, uh, Adri is one of the leading, uh, uh, one of the thought leaders in the region about how to create uh, Arabic technologies or how to create Arabic content uh, in general. That simply came from the question that we raised during the uh, days of uh, my MBA. So yeah, you guys are in the best program that you can ever imagine yourself at the moment from my perspective. Thank you, Ali. I can see Noura. What is your question, uh, Noura, to the panel? To Spain, I think, specifically. Noura? Uh, uh, my question is to Hussein. If you ha uh, my question is for Hussein. If you have one piece of advice to someone just starting out, what it would be? Oh, wow. Uh, just don't be scared. Literally, everyone is afraid of, of taking a risk and, and I get it. it. It makes sense because you leave something. But that, mind you, 2012, I was a chief business development officer for this massive company. That's a financial institution. And without a plan, I have a do I had a daughter that's like two, like almost eight, nine months old at the time. I just quit my job and decided I want to do my own business. I was getting paid almost to what? 4,000 dinars as a salary and I quit. No plan. And I thought, you know what, let me do this. And I started my first business and I failed, failed miserably. And I started my second business and again, I failed miserably, <laughs> right? To the extent where I had no money in my wallet to buy something as simple as Pampers, right? And I, was, I think it was a movie moment at some point where I was in, in, in the bathroom, fully dressed under the shower, hitting my head against the wall, thinking, what am I going to do? 
And then uh, I get a text from my, from my wife telling me, hey, I'd like to, order, which, can you please order this? She took a screenshot from Talaba tell, asking me to order something. And that's when I got my, you know, an idea and I thought, you know what, let me try to execute this. I think Talaba, and, and I thought, I wish I could click on this and it could go to cart. And then I created my first business that competed directly with Talaba called Pickadot. And I managed to raise $1.5 million for it off the bat. And I actually was able to get it from zero to 12,000 orders per week capitalizing only on the expat community in Bahrain. Uh, obviously, by providing something as simple as a multi-cart solution where you can order from six different restaurants in one single order. And, and that, that basically helped me, uh, you know, prove a concept, understand that, hey, there's something that makes sense. And then the same investors that invest in our, my business bought it out. They actually acquired the entire stake and offered me a, a price and they, they bought the entire company. Now, what I'm trying to say is, Yes, there has to be persistence. The two, I think I, the two main points you need to focus on if you're launching a startup is don't be scared and be persistent. Even if you don't have anything and you feel that everyone is against you, if you believe that you're providing a solution to a problem and if you believe and then you, believe, you, you understand that the market is the one that is the thing that actually moves you and you're able to pivot and adapt, then you'd be able to take your business or your idea from step zero to step one. And obviously, that's a, the, people think step zero to one is very small. It's actually a massive step towards a, a longer journey of success. So yeah, I hope that that gives you the best. Uh, I mean, my, my perspective on this, at least. Wonderful. So, any other questions, guys? I can see Rana. Uh, maybe you would like to ask a question. Yeah, hi, Dictora. Hi, everyone. It's hi. really nice to have you all. It's such a great experience and to learn from your uh, yani whatever you have done and uh, I, I, ha I have raised actually four questions and I think that Hussein has managed to reply to um, <laughs> yeah true <laughs> thing. and then one, one is, yeah he has already yeah. replied to one regarding the plans and the other one what are the mistakes that he he wished that he didn't avoid because he he spoke about the failure that he has faced the, the, the question that I want from Janahi is with the current situation of COVID-19, what I've been known already from my friends that, that are trying to get the support from Temkin, uh, it's it's currently there's an, an whole situation where, where the uh, Temkin are no longer for the current situation to provide the support they used to provide it. So let's see any startup that can start in the, these days, even if it's a small business. Will Temkin still open the floor to support or even flat six? And flat six is really interesting thing that I will try to read about them today after the class. As for the fourth, fourth question, anyone can answer regarding what are the strategies that we should build if we will start up a business? What strategies that we should take into consideration for us to have a successful forecasted plan or a program to be implemented in reality. So <laughs> that's for me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yes. Uh, maybe we'll start with Ahmed and then uh, to flash sure. the plan and maybe the rest could elaborate on the strategy. <laughs> yes. I think, uh, uh, first of all, thank you, Rana, for the question. Uh, uh, one thing to note that Temkin has never stopped the support for the startups community or the businesses in Bahrain ever not since 2006 when we were established. It's just Temkin is a very dynamic entity that tries to cope with the changes that are happening in the economy. At times, we had a program called Business Development, which was very much concerned with purchasing and supporting the supplies of, of uh, the operational infrastructure of the businesses, if that's the right word. Uh, today, with, after the pandemic, we're trying to be again dynamic and try to understand the challenges that the business community is facing. So we so we've came up with another program called the Business Continuity Program that supports the businesses at the current time to help them remain afloat given the current situation. Of course, what's going to happen next, we don't know. What, what we're trying to do as much as possible is to react to the changes in the economy and, and provide the support that's needed at that time. However, in addition to the programs that we provide internally, we will always support the, uh, the other enablers in the ecosystem, such as the accelerators, Fat6 Labs and others. So again, we will always be here to support the startups starting their journey with the different tools that they need at a, at a specific time. Soon we will be launching, inshallah, 
Uh, first of all, tomorrow we'll be announcing a different type of support for the business continuity program. And hopefully within yeah. one to two weeks, we'll be announcing as well our non-financial support post COVID-19. Again, it doesn't mean we're the experts and what the entrepreneurs need, but we bring people like Saleh, like Hussein, like Ali, again, to speak to the public at a larger scale. We we'll try to bring policymakers to do some sort of policy hacks where they talk about what challenges businesses are facing and how can they improve it with the business community rather than doing it in closed offices. So these sort of, of programs will always be uh, launched given the circumstances that the economy is going through. Uh, and if I may, although Hussein and Ali and Saleh would be better candidates to answer that question, if you're looking for the, the, the rule of thumb, the golden formula of success, I don't think you'll find that, but I'll leave the answer for my colleagues. Um, yeah, I guess to address the first question where you're asking about support, um, I guess you meant financial support during during this period. Um, for for us, it, it would be it would be the same as it always is. Whereas in um, you know we would still get involved in investing in a startup if we think that you have a solution that we like that we think scalable. So just to make that clear, it's it's not going to be businesses like barber shops or saloons or restaurants or coffee shops or and these kind of traditional businesses aren't the kind of things we get involved in. What we get involved in is it's it's I mean. There's a lot of confusion because some people say, does it have to be technology related? And not really, but like usually it's at least technology enabled where, you know, you're, 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 you're lowering your risk where I think that's another thing we've learned from COVID, right? Is that the guys who have not found other revenue streams, usually through a digital platform, are the ones that will probably end up uh, going bankrupt pretty much during this period. And so yeah. it's because of that that we look at, you know, digital is just usually a lot easier to be able to scale really quickly across the region and to be able to do at large uh, mass of scale, right? Um, so, so from that perspective, we would still be investing, but we wouldn't be going for companies that we feel aren't uh, going to really be able to survive through this, through this period. Um, and then for the second question, um, and Hossein and Ali can elaborate on this, but when it comes to a uh, key strategy, there's no rule of thumb. If anybody had really mastered that, everybody here would be a billionaire already, right? But um, the main the main thing I would say is one is be diligent, uh, have a good work ethic, um, do your research. I meet a lot of people, they, you know, they'll come to me, they'll be like, oh, I've got an idea, but if I'm going to tell you the idea, you have to sign a non-disclosure agreement with me. And it's like, you know, I'm meeting sometimes over a thousand uh, entrepreneurs per year. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's really about, you know, doing your research. You almost never, even if you're the only one in Bahrain that's got, that's thinking of doing this, I guarantee you there's usually eight other guys in Bahrain thinking of doing it at the same time. There's maybe three that are taking it to prototype stage and maybe only one will follow it through all the way to launch it. And maybe he won't even make it to the point where everybody in Bahrain hears about him because you won't actually end up uh, becoming uh, successful, right? So when it comes to that part, it's like, do, do your due diligence. Uh, you don't want to try and reinvent the wheel. A lot of the times you might have a solution. It's more important that you have a gap. If you identify a gap in the market for your solution, it doesn't mean that you have to be the only guy in the world doing it, right? Like there could be someone that's done it a long time ago in Asia or in, or in the States or in Europe. And they probably perfected it by this point where they've already gone through a whole bunch of mistakes and re, uh, iterations and everything to get to that point. And it's fine to bring a solution like that over to here and, and to develop basically to, to do a copycat, but it's still an original business in the country. So that's another thing to keep in mind. And uh, thirdly, it's, it's more that, uh, you know, you, like, like they're saying earlier, like you will, you know, very likely your first couple of times fail. And you shouldn't take that to heart. You should just always look at it as a learning curve. And it's just part of the process, right? So I'd say those are the fundamentals that you should keep in mind when 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 you're you know taking that approach to be an entrepreneur. And another thing is to be, become good at pitching. Like a lot of people don't realize yeah. how bad they sound when they when they go and approach an investor and they want to tell them their business idea. And you're there sitting for 15 minutes 
and you still like even somebody who's an expert of multiple verticals sometimes i have no idea like what are they trying to solve how are they going to make money out of this so you you should like my rule of thumb when it comes to how you speak to an investor if you can't go to one of your relatives who's 12 years old no matter how complicated your business is if you can't explain it to a 12 year old in five minutes and let him understand the problem the solution the market and how you're going to make money then you don't know how to pitch properly and you don't have the right pitch to take to an investor because you shouldn't expect that they're going to be experts on that particular solution you have or even that market it's your job to make it um, enticing to them and usually you don't have much time uh, people only have a limited attention span so that's the skill that's really good to perfect and for that you can just check yeah, out uh, sure. we have videos of people like Hussein and uh, all our other previous startups as well on uh, YouTube you can just go to Plastics Labs Bahrain channel you'll see um, how, how they pitch uh, professionally uh, yeah, and last time I shared with them the pitching of Alina uh, on the demo day in front of the audience and we opened that uh, on YouTube and they uh, got an idea about how to pitch. But since you mentioned the pitching, which is a very important point, and I would like to hear from Martin and Ali, since I think they went through this experience, what kind of advice would you provide to the students regarding good pitching in front of potential investors, maybe, or anyone who's going to provide support to them? Wow, well, pitching. Start. Pitching, yeah. pitching, <laughs> pitching is actually one yeah. of one of pitching. At some point in my life, was a was was a disaster. But then I quickly realized how the importance of pitching, and I can tell you for a fact that I think I, I not not to brag or flex or anything, but I think I one of one of the people that does it extremely well, uh, because um, because of the amount of times or the sheer amount, sheer amount of times I've done it, and because of what Plastic Labs pushed me to do as well during that time. So uh, we we with with the, with. I think the very the importance of pitching is is ex obviously it's extremely high. Uh, an investor needs to understand a couple of things about the business, and we need to understand what each investor or what each in the stakeholder that's listening to us is interested to know. So when you're pitching for an event, it's different. When you're pitching in front of a panel of investors, it's different. When you're pitching for a competition, it's completely different. You got to be able to do your research and due diligence on each individual that you're going to pitch to, to understand what are the key points that you want to talk about. But generally, when you're pitching, what you want to talk about is obviously the business, initially the, 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 the problem, and then the solution you're solving. Is there a market for that problem or, solu or, or solution? Um, what size is that market? Are there any competitors in that space? And then you take a look at um, if you've launched, you take a look at metrics, you take a look at growth, where you've been, what, you, what, what you've done, how you're going to make money as you go forward. And then you add, obviously, the, t uh, the team slide, which is, to me, the most important slide, because that's initially the first uh, thing that an investor would put money with. And then, obviously, mm -hmm. connect communication channels and whatnot. So pitching is it has to be structured generally in that way. But then obviously adding more in one side and less in another side depends on who your audience is. So knowing your audience is extremely important when you're pitching, for, uh, obviously, either it's on stage or off stage or in a private situation. And I, I leave some, some room for Ali to actually em emphasize on that as well. Yes, well you, you actually didn't leave much, Jose. <laughs> well, uh, so um, the, I actually second Hossein exactly on, uh, on the start of pitching. It's a little bit uh, of a challenge, um, uh, uh, but there's no way around it. You have to uh, try it and try it and try it and sweat through it. And, and, and I'm saying literally, I've done sweating through it until we got to a point that, um, uh, um, like Hossein, um, I'm quite comfortable to talk about uh, um, our idea. But I think the main part also, <clears throat> again, Hossein nicely mentioned that um, you, uh, you get prepared about your idea. And um, uh, I think uh, I, I'd like to connect this question with the previous question about the strategy. Nicely, the, the lady asked uh, that if you have if you have everything in your uh, in your mind prepared, the preparation is very important. You will be feeling comfortable and, and talking about it. So doing the research enough and having uh, having uh, the plan in exactly and particularly how to make the first uh, dinar. Uh, I think uh, I'd like to uh, make uh, an emphasis in here that uh, um, to be able of being comfortable talking about your um, your uh, uh, startup is when you answer that very fundamental question. We often Arabs and, and Muslims kind of like culturally have that difficulty uh, in thinking about money and how to actually grow the money. 
uh, and that's because of our fear of the greed. In fact, actually, the best strategy from my perspective, I'm not uh, uh, contradicting with any of my colleagues uh, in here, but simply just adding to that, the best strategy for starting a, a startup is to have an answer about how to make your first dinar out of that idea. And that one answer is going to actually be the driver for you, is going to be the point of research for you and so on and so forth. And that also is going to help you with the preparation when you go and, and sit in front of people in the in, in the elevator, in um, in the car uh, and uh, so on and so forth, that you, you'll, be, you'll be able to talk about it uh, um, quite comfortably. So preparation is important. Thank you so much, guys, for this amazing session and for all your feedback and all the insight that you have provided to our MBA students today. It was an amazing session full of information and details about uh, the ecosystem and how the different, let's say, entities within the ecosystem really providing support to entrepreneurs. Thank you so much for this beautiful interaction and for all the feedback that you have provided to the audience and to the students. So uh, our session comes to an end, and if you would like, you would like to close it, and uh, I will leave the floor to each one of you to, let's say, to provide maybe a bit of advice to the students to close with a uh, hey, thought in relation to the ecosystem, the support that could be provided to all our potential entrepreneurs, our MBA students, and to anyone who is listening to us today. Yeah, um, I just tell everybody to, you can go on our website, flat6labsbahrain.com. Uh, you can find out all the details of how we work in our program. If you want, you can even apply through there as well. Uh, so we we typically will go through the applications probably in a month or so and start picking the startups that we think would be good candidates for the next cycle. Um, and from our side, if you have any questions or doubts or you feel like this is a, a road you want to go along, but you, you're not sure of how to approach it, then you can reach out to myself, you can reach out to Hussein, Ali, um, all of us are happy to communicate with you at any time. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, please, you're more than welcome to add me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'd be more than happy to answer any question going forward. I, I, I mean, I'm extremely approachable. Uh, and uh, if there's anything else that you need to know about that six labs, about launching a startup, about my previous businesses, my current business, and if you want to give any feedback, I always reply on LinkedIn. I've mentioned that before. Uh, yeah. And hopefully if things go forward, if you need a little bit more advice, I'd be more than happy to share my contact details with you and we can, you know, arrange for something. You yeah, can visit so, us in the office. So please, uh, yeah. say all the guys share your contacts or the websites uh, on the chat. This way the student can get access to different web pages or on your social media platforms and they can follow you and maybe they will, let's say, directly contact you after the session. Ali, you would like to say something at the end of the session? Absolutely, Dr. Anji. Really appreciate uh, um, the, the discussion. I actually enjoyed it perhaps maybe even more than your students. Um, I think that the, the one final um, um, uh, thing uh, say, uh, I want to add is that uh, the MBA students are very well um, situated for running entrepreneurship, but there is a small, um, small fear. I know exactly in each of them now that uh, the entrepreneurial nowadays is very much uh, powered by technology and they might not have that background. That is actually absolutely irrelevant in, com uh, in comparison to the knowledge that you have about business. Uh, technology is nothing other than uh, Facebook, Instagram, um, Zoom, um, uh, Office 365 that you're already dealing with on daily basis. And uh, the moment that you get to that point that how you enable the business idea in your mind get, and getting it to the market, that's the time that you find a lot of others that could help you. And that's where you create the team and the team will uh, be uh, um, driving that forward. But you will be the leaders, always the MBA people. So um, believe in that and, and charge through it. Thank you. Ahmed. Just unmute yourself. OK, so I think it worked. It was yeah. tough for me. So uh, I'd like to start by thanking you, of course. I told Dr. Anji before we start that I might have to leave at 7, but again, 
I, I can't agree more with my colleagues. It was a great discussion that made me stay, to be honest. Um, uh, to end, I think if, uh, if my, my only message today is for the students, if you think you were inspired tonight by this session, by any of my colleagues, then your next step is to do something about it. It's either you can start a business, of course, I know push, we're pushing you toward that, but that's not necessarily the only thing you can do. You can do a lot. You can help startups by providing them with information, by providing awareness to the community as a whole. My, my, my only message to end today's session is please help us and become part of the ecosystem by doing anything that you can do at this point of time. And to correct something I was saying earlier, uh, my colleagues mentioned, uh, when we say that the, the million dollar question as as knowing what to do doesn't mean you should go and enter the business without a plan. Failing to plan is of course planning to fail. But again, come up with the right plan that may give you some insights on how to do, but of course you always have more questions to answer. Be confident and I think you're on the right track. Good Thank time. you so much. So I would like to thank you all. Really, it was an amazing session, very inspiring one, very motivating one to every single one. Uh, we really we really enjoyed the two hours and even more than two hours. We didn't expect to have more than two hours, but we had very nice and wonderful two hours uh, discussing entrepreneurship and really inspiring young entrepreneurs to join uh, this beautiful world, really risky one, but it's very nice uh, with a lot of opportunities and potential. Thank you so much all for being here today. Ahli University is always open towards any new opportunities to support entrepreneurs and to support students and to support the graduate and postgraduate as well. So you are most welcome, always you are most welcome to come and to share your thoughts, your ideas, your, uh, let's say, advices, your uh, whatever you have in relation to ecosystem and in relation to what you are providing to entrepreneurs with our students and with the whole Ahliya community. Thank you so much once again and hope to see you, inshallah, in other opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.